tonight we are in Deuteronomy 18 and 19. Deuteronomy 18 and 19. Alright, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Uh, the first portion of it here talks about the portion for the Levites and the priests. Let's read verses 1 through 8. Deuteronomy 18, 1 through 8. Who will grab that for us? Rob. The priests, the Levites, all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his portion. Therefore, they shall have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he said to them. And this shall be the priests do from the people, from those who offer a sacrifice, whether it is a bull or sheep, they shall give to the priests the shoulder, the cheeks, and the stomach, the first fruits of your grain and your new wine and your oil, and the first of the fleece of your sheep you shall give them. The Lord your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. So if a Levite comes from any of your gates, from where he dwells among all Israel and comes with all the desire of his mind to the place which the Lord chooses, that he may serve in the name of the Lord his God as all his brethren, the Levites do, who stand there before the Lord. They shall have equal portions to eat besides what comes from the sale of his inheritance. Okay. So he opens it up by pointing out that they don't have an inheritance with Israel. They're not like the other tribes there. Um, what was it that the Levites did have? What were they given? What was their apportionment beyond what's specifically mentioned here? We'll get to these things in just a moment. Does anybody remember? If you go back into the book of Numbers, you see where they were given cities. They were given 42 cities plus the six cities of refuge. There were three on the west side of Jordan, three on the east side of Jordan. So they had 48 cities. Uh, the book of Numbers in chapter 27 talks about how Levite males from one month and older number 23,000. So there's 23,000 of them that are going to be divided among the 42 cities. And if you recall, the way that it was apportioned is the larger tribes were to give more cities, the smaller tribes were to give fewer cities. So sort of on a percentage basis, they would be given these cities and they would spread out among these cities. If you just did strict math, um, it'd be 497.3 or something like that per city. But of course there would be some cities larger, some smaller, but be that as it may, they would be distributed, dispersed throughout the nation of Israel when they go in and inhabit the land. Now why were they spread throughout the land? Why would the Lord say, you don't get a territory, but I'm going to take you and spread you through all these different cities and the different territories of all the tribes? They were the spiritual leaders for the nation, so they needed to be spread out in the places where they were located. All right, Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Uh, 9 through 11, rather. Leviticus 10, 9 through 11. Who will read that for us? Clint, go ahead. Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. You nor your sons with you. When you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean, and you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. Okay. So part of their duty, uh, this is Aaron on down through all the Levitical um, priesthood and the Levites. Uh, as a tribe, as Rick has said, their responsibility is to, to teach the people. They were to be those who preserve the law and help people to know and to understand that law. 
And so they're spread throughout to have that type of influence. Uh, what happened, by the way, we're just going to jump forward for a second here. What happened when the kingdom divided with Rehoboam in the south, Jeroboam in the north? Does anybody remember? Jeroboam appointed priests from the people. Okay, Jeroboam. Right. If you want to take a quick peek, 2 Chronicles chapter 11. 2 Chronicles 11. And beginning in verse 13, it talks about from all the territories, priests and Levites who were in Israel took their stand with him, that is with Rehoboam. But the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem, where Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them from serving as priests to the Lord. So they, they rejected the Levites in the northern kingdom. What happened to the northern kingdom as a result of that? I mean, there's other things involved, but what happened? Completely gone. Completely gone. They, you know, the southern kingdom, they had some good kings, some bad kings, some good, bad. You know, it, it varied at times. The northern kingdom never had any good kings. That that nation, the northern nation of Israel, never recovered from the apostasy of Jeroboam. And part of that had to do with these Levites, that influence being rejected, being pushed out of that nation. They didn't want the religion of Jehovah up there. And it never recovered. Now there were prophets who were sent up there from time to time and dealt with the people. But they never did really recover. So, jump back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. And here he's talking about these Levites. They don't have an inheritance. They have cities. They have homes in the cities. They have common land in the cities. But they don't have a territory. They don't have the ability, the resources like the rest of the tribes are going to have. So what's the provision in Deuteronomy 18 that he makes for them? How are they going to get by? He commanded the rest of the congregation to support them. Okay. And all that they need. Right. In question one, I had asked, how were the Levites to be treated and why? So they're, they're to be supported. Is there anything else to add to that? Verse uh, 4 says they were to be given the first fruits. And in many ways, that's the relationship that they were to have with their sacrifice to God. The first, the best. So he says that the Levites are to get the same. Verse uh, 8, they're to be treated equally. It doesn't say treated equally, but it uses they shall eat equal portions. So they weren't to get less quality or less quantity uh, per se. They were supposed to get a fair and honorable and respectable amount. And in a lot of ways, they're trading the types of service. The Levites are ministering into the people's spiritual service and the people in return are ministering into the Levites' physical service so that they see each other. Right. Right. And there there to be provided with these things, the people are to bring it to them and in part it, it's an offering of respect for the Lord, but it's the way the Levites are going to be cared for in their daily sustenance, their needs, things like that. Um, now, when you get down uh, to verse 6 through 8, it says that a Levite of any of your gates you know, basically ones who are spread throughout the entire territory of Israel, if he chooses, verse 7, he can go down and he can serve at before the Lord. Of course, that's going to be at the tabernacle and eventually at the temple. So if there's a Levi, let's say in the territory of Dan, and he says, you know what? I want to go down to Jerusalem and serve at Jerusalem. That's where I want to live. I want to be at, at the temple and things like that. He had the right to be able to do that. And it says that he would be able to sell 
his inheritance in verse 8. So he could sell his home in the territory of Dan, whatever city he may be in, and move to Jerusalem, keep that money from the sale of it, and then he could go down and serve at the tabernacle and get that equal portion of support that's being brought to the, to the temple. Um, and then in the year of Jubilee, that home that he sold was to go back to him, back to his family. So they're to be looked after, they're to be taken care of. They had some freedoms, even though they didn't have their own territory. They had some freedoms of where they could go, what they could do. But the underlying thing is, they were to be cared for, respected, helped, supported by the people. Any other thoughts there? Just the inverse five that is very specific where God said because of all of your tribes, God has chosen them. So they already understood what it was like or were, should have to be chosen by God to be the nation. And yet even out of that, these men were chosen above all of the rest of them. So it kind of, to me, re-emphasized this is the group that he said that will handle all of the things that have been sanctified and purified and taken care of. Right. And God in doing this is reinforcing a separateness and a holiness, a sanctification that it takes to serve in His presence, to serve in His cause. That flows through from separating Israel itself into separating the Levites, into separating the descendants of Aaron as the priest and the high priest. It's, it's flowing all the way through there, emphasizing those lessons. Any other thoughts? All right, let's read verses 9 through 14. 9 through 14 as he warns them about pagan practices. Who will read Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14? Go ahead, Hank. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is given you, you shall not learn to follow this abomination of the fellow nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or sorcery, or one who conjures spells, or medium, or spirits, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and the cause of the abomination, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord, for these nations which you will dispose, listen to soothsayers, buyers, but for you, the Lord of God, but, but for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Okay. Uh, so, What's he telling them here? What's what's the what's the warning? Really, it's verse twelve. Well, that's one of the reasons they were told to totally destroy them in the beginning. It's because of these things that they practice and their their customs are waiting. Their, their, their basic religion. That's what they call their religion. Right. And so if the Israelites go in and adopt these things, what's going to happen with them? He warns all the way through the book. But yeah, so he's, best, he's saying, don't be stupid and go in there and act like them when I'm sending you in there to destroy all of that. It's kind of like an alcoholic. An alcoholic goes into a bar and he sets the... He does it over and over and over. Eventually, he's going to want that what is before him. Yeah, he should not want any part of that, and they're not to want any part of what these people are doing. And he lists a, uh, some specific things in there, and I asked him question two, no two to three abominations and an example of them today. So what are some of the things he mentions, and what is it that we see practiced today? Do we still have paganism? Paganism is all around us. What do we have? Anything? We still have horoscopes. Horoscopes. What would that be equal to in here? The soothsayer. Yes. The soothsayer is the horoscope person, the psychic, the palm reader, 
All that kind of stuff. That's what the soothsayer is. Today, we don't call them soothsayers. We call them palm readers or whatever they do. What else? Uh, sacrificing children, which is abortion. We don't call it that, but it is, that's what abortion is. What, what do we call it? Um, we call it women's health. Women's health. Pro-choice. Women's uh, rights. Women's rights. Um, one of the greatest abominations on our nation and something for which God is not just going to let that go. So we, we might as well just get ready. You know, we can see what's happening in our nation. But. Well, and it, it actually, they're, they're redefining the word abortion. They don't like that word. And it now, over and over again in the news, is called women's health. Yeah. Providing women's health. Women's health. Right. Women's health. And what they're talking about is abortion. abortion. They're talking about ripping, about women's health. ripping a baby out of the womb, slicing it up, chopping it to pieces, <laughs> dissolving it chemically. That's what they're talking about. It's not women's health, it's murder. But be that as it may. Alright, what else? I know the psychics and magicians. Well, air quote magicians. Uh, that's not to say that people have good drinks and beautiful sleight of hand. But there are those who believe that. Well, that there magic exists, and that's, I guess, a so there, there are people who believe in black magic. It's what we might call it. Sometimes it's referred to. Uh, people who are involved who believe they're witches and warlocks and um, Wiccan religion. That type of stuff is out there. It's alive and well in our country, in Europe, and other places. Yeah, so exactly right. What about a medium or a spiritist? People who they're talking to the dead, they can't talk to the Okay, dead. yeah, they, they say, well, we talk to the dead, okay? One of the greatest scams ever, because how are you going to prove that they're not talking to the dead, but people are gullible enough to buy into that. People can't talk to the dead. There, there I think of two occasions where somebody was actually talking to the dead that wasn't dead themselves, right? The rich man and Lazarus, you, all those people are dead. The other one is Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. But then there's an Old Testament account where Saul goes to see a spiritist and a medium. And when Samuel appears, the medium is freaked out because it doesn't happen. Right? It shows that, that account itself shows that she never expected that to happen. So it, it's fake, it's a fraud. And he's saying people who try to do that, they're involved in these things. That's paganism. God sent them in to destroy that, to get rid of it among the people. Um, there's TV shows. In fact, I think there's talk shows and stuff. There's things called seances. That's what fits in this category. All right. Any other thoughts? I just have one question. Mm -hmm. What does it mean whenever they're saying not to make your son or daughter to pass through the fire? Okay. Is that a form of sacrifice? Yes. Again? Yes, that sacrifice. There's, there was a god, Molech. Um, they, they built a, um, a, an idol, an image. It would have its hands up like this. The cavity of its chest would be open. They would build a fire down below. And they would set their babies in there and roll down into the fire. That's, that's the idea of the passing through the fire. All right, let's read 15 to 22, please. Who will get that? Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22. Go ahead. The Lord your God will raise up, raise up for you a copper blood and meat from your midst, from your brother, then you shall hear. According to all you desire of the Lord your God in order, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire among many more. Bless thy God. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up from them for them a prophet like you among your brother of their brother, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command. 
and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. For the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not permitted him to speak, but who speaks in the name of other gods, the prophet shall not. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? And the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if this thing does not happen, you will come to pass. That is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You should not be afraid of it. All right, thank you. Question number three I'd ask, where are these verses, specifically 15, 18, 19, found in the New Testament? What does it mean? So what do we have here? Anybody have a New Testament passage, Zach? Acts 3.22. Okay. One of the more extensive quotes of this is in Acts 3.22. And what's happening on that occasion? Uh, the first gospel sermon had just been preached. Uh, Peter... Right. First gospel sermon in Acts 2. And then in Acts 3 we... Have what? Second gospel sermon. Yeah. Remember they had healed a, a lame man and a big crowd gathered around and Peter's preaching to them. And go ahead, Zach. As he's preaching to them, what's he focusing their mind on? Twenty-two, twenty-three. Yes, sir. Acts three, twenty-two, and following there. Peter quotes this passage here, and what's what's he nailing down for them? Remember, this is a crowd of Jews at the temple. Anybody remember what he's saying? Twenty-three says, "It shall be every soul who will not hear." That prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Okay, so he quotes about Moses, Lord of God, raise up a prophet like me, whom you shall hear in all things, whatever he says. You, you have to hear, the one who won't hear will be utterly destroyed. All the prophets from Samuel and those who follow have spoken of this. And he gets down to the point in verse 26. What's his point? Why does he bring up, Moses said there's another prophet coming. Verse 26, he nails it. What's that? Jesus is that prophet. You know, he's telling all these Jews, look, you, you revere Moses. Well, you know what? Moses told about Jesus, and earlier in the passage he said, you, you murdered him. You killed him. And he's the one that Moses had foretold would come, and God said, if you don't listen to Him, you're going to be utterly destroyed from among the people. So, this prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 is pointing forward to Christ. And the people knew there was the prophet that was coming. Anybody have another passage where this is? Okay, John 1.45. And who's speaking there? And who? Philip talking to Nathaniel and tells him what? Also, the prophets were Jesus' message. We found the one that Moses had talked about. Where's that at? John 1.45. Also in John 1.21, when John the baptizer was being questioned, they asked him, are you the prophet? And that question is, are you the one Moses talked about in Deuteronomy 18? And then they speculated in John 6, well, Jesus, He's the prophet. He's the one. And of course, He was the one. Um, so the New Testament repeatedly connects Jesus to this prophecy. Again, that shows inspiration of the Scripture. It shows God's divine will that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. And we can have confidence in Him. 
But then also that point that you have to hear Him. You have to listen to Him. Remember in the uh, Transfiguration that uh, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus were there. Peter wanted to build those tabernacles for all three of them, but God appeared and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Not the law, not the prophets. Hear Him. So we're to listen to Him. Nancy. I also have John 12, 48 and 40, where Jesus specifically says He is not speaking His own words, but the words of His Father, which was also in that prophecy, that, prophecy, that the prophet would speak the words that I tell Him to speak. Exactly. And again, you have to accept Me. If you don't hear Me, you will judge. Right. Being the Divine Son of God, the representative of the Father, the prophet, we had to hear that message because he was in full fellowship with the Father. Um, so Moses then goes on back in Deuteronomy chapter 18 to warn them about prophets who would come and speak presumptuously. What, what Question number four is, what is one test the Israelites were to apply to the prophets? It's pretty simple. If he says something's going to happen, it doesn't happen, then what do you know? <laughs> He's not speaking for God. You know, God doesn't miss it. So he says that's a, that's a very easy way to tell it. What does he say to do with those presumptive prophets? He says to be afraid of them. In other words, avoid them. Don't well, to not be afraid of them because they're not speaking for God. Yeah, not be afraid. Yeah, in that in that sense, and then Deuteronomy eighteen twenty tells them to do what? I shall die. You shall die. You don't tolerate. It. Somebody comes along and presumptuously says they're representing God and they're not. That that's blasphemy. So they need to be executed. Get rid of them. From among you. Now, question five, I had asked, how do we test the prophets? Clint. We measure their words against God's word. Because it is the standard. It is the truth. And if they're not speaking the truth, then it will sound different than the truth we already know in the prayer. Hey, any passage to go along with that? Compare what people say to what God says, we're told very specifically to do that. Clint. Okay, first John 4, 1, all the way down through 6, John deals with that and says, You test the spirits, whether they are of God. You test them. He who hears us is of God. He who does not hear us is not of God. So what's another way to word that? The same teaching is found in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. Where Paul says, you know, they come, they preach another gospel, which is not another gospel. There are those that would pervert the word. They pervert it. They change the course of it. If anyone comes to you and does not preach what you've heard preached, what is to happen? They're to be accursed. Though we are an angel from heaven, come to you. So what's another way to word that? Another way to put that is truth agrees with truth. If somebody comes and preaches something that doesn't agree with the divine revelation, the known truth of God, you're to reject it. Just that simple statement of even if an angel comes to you, that's pretty strong to think about. Because they're going to know. An angel should know. Whereas people down here, you don't know whether they know or not. But as long as it's not going on what the word says, even an angel Right. Paul puts it in such strong terms. You know, even if an angel himself comes to you and says something different, you don't accept it. You don't listen to what they have to say. They're to be a curse. So the truth agrees with truth. And 
Moses is warning the people here, you know, there will be people who come along and act like they're representatives of God, and they'll claim something, but it doesn't come to pass. You don't have to listen to them, and they actually need to be executed. Yes? You can also have the uh, spirit of the Bruins in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These are more fair minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they receive the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they received it, but they also did their research. And so we can hear things from preachers and from any other person who might be more spiritual minded than us. But if we're not actually looking to God for it to hear it, then we're just, we're just listening. Right. We, we have to, um, for lack of a better term, internalize it. We have to process it. We have to examine it. We have to test it ourselves. We shouldn't believe any person because it's that person. Maybe somebody we grew up listening to or somebody who baptized us or somebody who's a really good speaker or whatever it may be. We're not to do that. We're supposed to take what we hear compared to Scripture. Is that what the Scripture says? And if it is, we accept it. We're convicted by it. We stand for it. Very. That's a good passage. Just to add to that, that we challenge our own thoughts too. That we don't take our own our own thoughts and say that, that must be the case because it came from within me. That's not sufficient either. You're telling me that I feel like is invalid. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, like 99%. Right. The heart is more deceitful than anything else. We can, we can understand it. Right. Our mindset, so. We we are to train our heart, our mind, our conscience by the Word of God. And there are things then it helps us to, to begin to realize, okay, what I'm hearing that doesn't sound right because I've studied the Word of God. I, I know what it says. And maybe we need to go back and examine and dig deeper. Or maybe it's something we haven't heard before. We need to go back and dig deeper. Find out, is, is this what the Scripture teaches? And if it is, we need to accept it. If it's not, we need to reject it. Any other thoughts there? Alright. Jumping down now to chapter 19. Chapter 19. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, part of it's talking about the cities of refuge. But I just want to make the point. Here he talks about this. What was what's the example that he gives for the need for the cities of refuge? But accidental death. Uh, so there's an accident flies off as you're talking to one and you get somebody who tells them you need to run to the city. Okay. Would that be the only time? Okay. I can see somebody's donk, donkey kicking somebody in the head. Or you run them over, you run the cart down, down the path, and maybe a child runs out in front of you. You know, it's unfortunate, but those things happen. So there may be any number of scenarios where someone's life is taken, but it was accidental, as we would say. Ron? Yes, and as he mentions, unintentionally. Uh, and it's interesting, he says, not having hated him in time past. So right. You better be careful. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you, yeah. If, if you've openly criticized verbally let people know I don't like you know Frank over there who's my next door neighbor and you're out chopping wood one day and he's behind you and it kills him you're in trouble <laughs> you're in trouble um, but hopefully there would be witnesses which we'll talk about in just a minute that would say well you know he, he really didn't mean to do that he was just chopping his wood but anyway yeah so what, what's the difference here? How would we put it in our modern language? Yes, the difference between first degree murder and manslaughter. Right. Manslaughter and first degree murder. There's unintentional killing and intentional killing. It's interesting to me that he says here, okay, the man who unintentionally killed his neighbor, what's he's to do what? Let's just... I know it's basic, I know it's simple, I know we talk, but what's he to do? 
flee to the city of refuge and do what? You, you stay there. Okay. You know, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before. There's no jails in the Bible. Because how do they handle things? Okay. This one. Why, why would they tell this person who's accidentally killed someone else, go to that city of refuge and you, you stay there until the death of the high priest. You, you stay there. Why would they tell him to do that? Because he mentions another person in, in all of this. Was there not uh, an Avenger, the nearest family member, who would have the right to take the life, which is the last question you asked? Right. The Avenger of blood. Okay. You don't want to run into him. You, you get away. You go to safe harbor. You didn't mean to do it. You, you go away. And it's not house arrest, but it's kind of city arrest, right? You, you need to stay there until the death of the high priest, then you can return home, however long that may be. But you stay there. As long as you're there, you are legally protected. And the idea is if that avenger of blood went into the city of refuge and killed that person, that avenger of blood would be put to death. But if the person who accidentally killed their relative goes back, and they get killed. Well, you're not supposed to do that. So, so there's there's limitations here to try to stop, if you will, a blood feud, stop that revenge. It, it's it's trying to tamp that out among the people. Uh, so there is safe haven there. Now, verse 14. Let's read that. Deuteronomy 19:14. We'll grab that. Just one verse. Go, go ahead. You shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which the men of the home have set, and your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land the Lord your God has given you to possess. Okay. Why do they talk about these cities of refuge and and manslaughter and, and all of that? And then verses 15 to 21, he's talking about witnesses and stuff. Why, why would he throw this landmark in the middle of that? Those are common. Common? Yeah, they're a common thing. People, people lose their take all the time. They're going to get more land. But they have to pay for that. Okay. More people have died over land than any other thing. Okay. I, I saw the headline of a story, I think it was last week. Uh, this guy got into an argument with the contractor over the price of his work and he shot him dead. Okay. People, when it comes to money, when it comes to their land, they can get out of control really quick. And it's, if somebody's out there moving the stakes on your land, you imagine now, let's, let's say you, you've got 500 acres in your territory and that's where you graze your sheep and somebody comes and moves those landmarks and you've lost 100 acres and now you don't have that grazing land, maybe your best hundred acres. You know, there's an entire history about the United States and the cattle wars out west and, and you know, putting up fences, not putting up fences, all that kind of stuff. And they would kill each other in a heartbeat over those things. Same thing was going on or could have gone on in Israel. You, you don't do that. You don't go and move those because that can lead to murder. So stay away from it. Respect the landmarks and the territory that people have been given. Um, I'm going to come back to something in just a minute. I know some of you are probably thinking about it. But let's read now uh, verses 15 to 21, please. 15 to 21. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 21. Go ahead, Clint. One witness shall not rise against the man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men of the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. And the judges shall make careful inquiry, and indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. 
so you shall put away the evil from among you. And those who remain shall hear and fear, and hereafter they shall not again commit such evil among you. Your eyes shall not pay, life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Okay. So laws concerning the witnesses. The facts have to be established by two or three witnesses. Now, he says, he grants, okay, sometimes there may be a case where it's one-on-one. One-on-one. -on -one. What do you do in that case? First, he deals with it, verse 16, 17, following that. Stand before the Lord, and the priest needs to judge in this. And exactly how all they might have, have done that is not revealed here. But he says, you have that done. And then he's talking about the false witness. What's to happen with the false witness when he's found out to be false? Hey, he's to be executed, right? If, if he is claiming somebody else has done something that's worthy of death, and he's found out to be a false witness, he's to be put to death. So, my question, number six, is what's penalty? Well, the second part, really, would this be a good law today? So, it's healing, healing, and tolerating um, factual, factual things. She means yes. Law and order. <laughs> yeah. Be a great law for today. Right? They, you think about how many frivolous lawsuits are filed, and you know, this company did that, and I, I, I slipped on this sidewalk or on their floor, or I spilled hot coffee on myself and come to find out it's your fault, it's not their fault. Well, okay, I was looking for $10 million. Guess what? You need to pony up $10 million for that. that. I think this is a great wall. That is, anything that the death penalty is truly imposed for, <coughs> which we don't have very often today, right. anything that is imposed for will make a person stop and think before they do so. Because that's what they, most people don't want. So, Right. So they can nowadays they go to prison. They don't think about it. So prison, yeah, that, free them. meal, right. education, health care, <coughs> all that kind of stuff. So go, going back to Zach, go ahead. Well, just going back to this, if you will, jurisprudence of the law of Moses. You don't have jails. You have fines. You know, certain cases, like if you kill somebody's animal or you take it and you have to repay, there's fines that are involved. And then there's some of these other penalties, like if you gouge somebody's eye out, guess what? Your eye gets gouged out. You know, these kinds of things. And then ultimately, death penalty for certain things. So the, the crimes would be dealt with immediately and justly and Firmly, and it's going to suppress crime among the people. That's, that's the effect it has. As opposed to putting them up, caring for them, dragging out the, the legal process, the justice that would be served. That's, that's not present here. You think about what he's talking about here. One is a respect of property rights. Right? That's fundamental to society. You need to have a respect for property rights. There's a trial. There are multiple witnesses required. There's an investigation. They say inquire about these things. And there's a barrier against false accusations. This is a model of how to enact justice and righteousness in a land. So, so I originally wrote the same thing. Yes, this would be the law today, like you said. It would suppress the number of false witnesses, but then I changed my answer to no. Okay. Because Jesus says in Matthew 5, 38, a different law. And it's still relational between God's people. This is talking about relations between the Israelites. In Matthew 5, Jesus is talking about the kingdom. He says, You've heard that it was said, and I turn I a tooth for tooth. But I say to you, do not resist to him who is evil, but whoever stops from the right cheek, turn to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, to be sure, let him be the front also. Whoever shall force you to warm up, which will too. 
give to him and ask to you, you do not turn away from him who wants to honor from you. So what was given in the old laws, the law of retaliation is now being modified or perhaps even reversed or like that to call the law of non-resistance. And so I think there's a change in that principle under the new law. So I originally had yes, but then I changed it to no based on that passage of being interested in your thought on that. I'm going to get you to change it back to yes. <laughs> and here's why. Because the law of Moses, yes, it was for the Israelites, God's people, but it was both spiritual and a national law, right? In the New Testament, the church and state are separated. So in Matthew 5, Jesus is talking about the kingdom. And he's talking about they had a misunderstanding about the kingdom and, and how you should deal with things. The, so there's the national which I'm talking about for the false witnesses, the, the death penalty, things like that, that's good for a nation. And then there's the law of Christ that applies to the church. Now, ideally, everyone would observe it, everyone would follow it, but that doesn't happen. That's why in Romans 13, it talks about you know the government's there to punish evildoers, uh, which would include the death penalty, you know, the sword. So there's a, there's a bit of a separation there. But yeah, the, and, and on the law of retaliation, when it talks about eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, I know some people view that as, well, that's, that's getting revenge. The law of Moses, when you read through it entirely, that's more of a limitation that you can't go beyond that. So if somebody took my eye, I couldn't take their life, right? So he limits it, but it is an equal... In other words, the punishment fits the crime type of thing versus go take revenge. He took your eye, so you know, go gouge his out because you're angry or whatever. It's, it's more of a uh, limitation and of uh, the punishment fits the crime. Does so that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we are out of time. Thank you all very much, Lord willing. Uh, I will be gone next week. Mike is, or uh, sorry, Clint is going to be taking Deuteronomy 2021. 20, so, Lord willing, y'all be able to do that next week, and I'll be out of town.